Our next speaker up is uh, Dr. Robert Price. And uh, I had actually printed out a bio of his, uh, but he'd written so many books, it was like 10 pages long, and we would be here till way later than we should have been. Uh, so I'm just going to read it off of here. Um, he's a professor of theology and scriptural studies at uh, Johnny Coleman Theological Seminary. He's a noticed, re noted religious skeptic, especially of Orthodox Christian beliefs. He occasionally describes himself as a Christian atheist. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's kind of like a Christian scientist, isn't it? Or Christian science, not a Christian scientist. Um, uh, he's a veteran of the Jesus Seminar, and he edits the Journal of Higher Criticism. His books include Beyond Born Again, the, uh, the Widow Traditions in Luke Acts, A Feminist Crucial Scrutiny, Deconstructing Jesus, and The Incredible Shrinking Son of Man. Everybody, please join me in giving a piratey welcome to Dr. Robert M. Price. Yeah, thanks. Yar, it's good to be here. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I was speaking of the books, I'm working on a couple more now. Uh, one having to do with manuscript evidence in the New Testament of the strange uses to which it's put off, and I'm thinking of calling that one, when I get that feeling, I want textual healing. Uh, the last sentence of the book will be, I can't wait to interpolate. Uh, then I'm uh, sort of planning on another one on devotionalism called uh, Have You Accepted Jesus as Your Imaginary Playmate? And, uh, uh, but uh, the folks at Prometheus tend to wimp out on uh, uh, controversial titles like the, the book that uh, Richard and I and some others uh, put together, a bunch of essays on the resurrection or lack thereof that appeared as The Empty Tomb. Uh, that wasn't our title. We were going to call it Jesus is Dead. And uh, they uh, figured that nah, nobody would ever buy that. So I couldn't win the, uh, the dispute with them. So I said, I'm not letting that title go to waste. So I wrote another one with that title, and American Atheists published it. So uh, to me, the titles are more important than the content. Uh, another book you might want to look out for, I don't think it's on Amazon quite yet, but soon should be, is by Earl Doherty, uh, and it's, uh, it's a double-sized expanded version of his great book, The Jesus Puzzle, and this one is called Christ Neither God Nor Man, uh, and it is really super. Uh, this man has just this incredible x-ray vision into the text. I've studied the New Testament from various perspectives for decades, and I'm reading this guy and thinking, but what an idiot I am. Why did I never see this? Why did I never think of that? Just astonishing stuff. Uh, some may object and carp, uh, well, this can't be much. Uh, he had to resort to publishing his own book. Well, yeah, so did Hume. Enough said on that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this, uh, this isn't my topic, but I just get upset every time I hear Peter Singer and his theories mentioned. The only guy I ever turned down is a Facebook friend. Uh, 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 the, the idea that, that uh, a human baby is of less importance than a friggin' dog. Uh, you know, I might accept this guy's views on animals if they were all like Bugs Bunny, because he is, because like Bugs Bunny, he made a wrong point on uh, an albacoike uh, to get to where he's got. But uh, at any rate, uh, I guess I shouldn't hurl nasty stuff like that. What I do want to talk about actually is um, is skepticism and historical method. And uh, what I want to try to show is not that skeptics use history to gain a skeptical result. Uh, that, that w wouldn't it be great if we could prove that there was no God, if there was no Jesus or something? Let's come up with some method to show it. That, that would be axe grinding. It uh, just would be propaganda. But some th think that it's like that because they want the liberty to propose an alternative sort of believing historical method, as sometimes called, or a faithful historical method. And that is in the nature of the case impossible, and it's an error that underlies a lot of the stuff that I deal with in my reviews and books. For instance, uh, in a new book by uh, Paul Eddy and Greg Boyd, called The Jesus Legend, <laughs> again, not, don't confuse it with uh, G.A. Wells' The Jesus Legend, 
uh, they take me to task quite often. I know and like these guys. Don't don't mean to, you know, just attack them, but uh, they they give it to me and. Uh, I think they're just wrong, wrong, wrong. And one thing they cannot get straight is that uh, historical critics of the Bible uh, do not begin with naturalistic philosophical assumptions. Now, not that there's anything wrong with such assumptions. I tend to be uh, agnostic on such things in that a, a twerp like me could never hope to understand what's really going on in the universe. I mean, so the idea is absurd. Uh, how could I ever know such a thing? Uh, but I do know what you have to, uh, what tools conceptually you have to use to do history. And they are, uh, they involve methodological atheism. And uh, as if you didn't understand that, I guess I want to take a little time explaining why that is in a second. Uh, why there isn't any place to entertain a serious possibility of divine intervention and miracles having occurred in the past, and that that does not involve a dogmatic belief that they cannot have happened. You'll see in just a second. But the, the element of skepticism and doubt I like very much and have remembered for many years a uh, discussion in Paul Tillich's book, The Dynamics of Faith, in which he d discusses three types of doubt or skepticism. Uh, he's very systematic. Uh, Tillich was very systematic in everything he did, and I, I've always found his work lucid. I, I know a lot of people don't, but I don't understand why. He re even I read this uh, man's book when I was still uh, like the old the old 50s monster movie, I was a teenage fundamentalist. Uh, I read this, uh, I guess I was in, I was in college, but, uh, it, it, but even then I thought this, you know, what a genius, this guy really lays it out very well. And he said that the three kinds of doubt that have to be distinguished, one of them, especially for uh, considering religion, he says there is, um, I, I guess what he would call a constitutional or attitudinal uh, doubt, where someone is just cynical or despairing of the truth to the degree that they become indifferent to finding it. They just don't think you can ever know, and so really what's the point? It's kind of like the old joke where the teacher uh, surprises this kid. Uh, says, oh, now, the student, so what's the difference between uh, agnosticism and apathy? And the kid says, Frank, uh, what do you think? Huh, what the, I don't know and I don't care. That's right. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, uh, the one passes into the other, uh, and he says, there, so there's this despairing idea that it would be good to know the truth if we could, but we probably can't, so the heck with it. And he says, even that has an element of faith in the truth. Even somebody like that, though they may be jaded, is so disappointed at not being able to find the truth that it shows that they, uh, th they do believe in truth, at least as a category, even if it's an empty one, as Nietzsche said. You always need to remind yourself there's a category of truth, albeit empty, lest you come to believe your favorite fictions would fit nicely in that category. And uh, he says the, the person who um, despairs of truth wanted the truth and somehow believed in the truth, just isn't satisfied with any of the proposed candidates for it. Interesting. I uh, said there is also uh, existential doubt, where you have committed yourself to some great cause or notion, some ultimate concern, and uh, you've really laid it on the line. Your life is now about this, whatever it is. And he says there's always going to be the nagging doubt. What if I'm fooling myself? What if this really is not the, the ultimate thing, this, this religion or following the Grateful Dead around the country or, you know, whatever it is. Uh, suppose I'm wasting my life. Well, you just can't sit on the fence. You got to live your life for something. Okay, I'm going to take that risk. And there's always the risk of faith because of existential doubt. Is it really worthwhile? But right in the middle, there is methodological doubt that uh, is at the heart of science and history and all sorts of inquiries like that, where it's built into the method, where you have to uh, scrutinize all the evidence and say, I 
looking for a conclusion. I seek to verify a hypothesis, but the way to do it is to see if it can be falsified. Can it stand the test? Uh, what uh, hurdles can I erect for it to jump over? Because it's going to have to do that. It's got to run the gauntlet, a new paradigm, a theory, whatever. It's, it's got to pass the test. So what test can I devise? You've got to be skeptical about it. And, and then if it uh, does pass the test or seem to for the moment, you make a tentative uh, commitment to that you know, until something better comes along, an important qualifier. Well, he says this is uh, inevitable in religion, and it, it's the doubt that deals with facts. And, uh, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I may have just misspoken there. He says this, this is alien to religion or should be. Now, in fact, it's not. As Victor was just saying, you, you can always say, well, here's what I think religion ought to be, and that's worth doing, but then it's important to reckon with what the religion uh, of people actually is. Uh, Tillich held a, a view somewhat like that uh, non-overlapping magisteria thing some decades earlier, and he knew most people didn't look at it this way, but he said there'd be a lot less trouble and you would understand it better if you did. He says, if someone is committed to the inquiry coming out a particular way, the facts being this way and not that way, uh, hoping and betting that when the day is done, Jesus will have proven to have risen from the dead or the exodus will be vindicated as a real historical event, knowing that tomorrow some new evidence might come up, like uh, I'm reading a bunch of novels right now about uh, well, not all at the same time, but uh, uh, about uh, lost gospel discoveries. There's about 45 of these things that I've been able to come up with, and I'm writing a book on them. Well, uh, they come up with some new Dead Sea Scroll or some new Nag Hammadi text written by Jesus or by Joseph of Arimathea explaining where he put the body of Jesus and there was no resurrection. Fascinating stuff. Uh, and uh, I'm only justifying the guilty pleasure of reading this stuff by writing my own book about it. But, but the point is this could happen you know I mean we are finding surprising discoveries of manuscripts and and uh, it could happen I mean you, you could find some all it would take is some sort of authentic Roman register of uh, crucified uh, prisoners one of them Jesus the Nazarene or something I mean it's it's the la or a letter from somebody saying I heard this Jesus preach in synagogue he's not bad I mean we have stuff like that about Apollonius of Tyana for instance and nobody's trying to prove anything they just happened to mention that they saw the the great man and that anchors him as a historical figure no such thing is is present in the case of Jesus whether by just bad luck or because there was no Jesus, who knows? But some discovery might be made, uh, and, uh, and, and faith would hinge on that, but the believer says, uh, because of what he's got invested, I'm just betting there won't. I'm just betting that, that any fair analysis of the facts is going to come out my way, and of course... Then you get in, into a bind because you, uh, and, and Van Harvey talks about this in his great book, uh, The Historian and the Believer. You can never know if your judgments are being made with a good conscience anymore because uh, are you warping your judgment of the evidence because of what you would like to believe to be true? Well, Tillich says this is the kind of mess you get in if your ultimate concern depends upon a dubious historical proposition, a theory, a reconstruction that might wind up being true, might not, or you might never know. So what business do you have saying, yeah, it, it's got to be true, so I believe it to be true? Yeah, that's just producing a, a, a fault line that is not only going to commit you to dishonesty in your historical work, and every book of apologetics uh, shows that. Uh, Victor just gave these great examples. Uh, you know, what more do you need, Craig? What more do you need, uh, uh, Gish or D'Souza? How many hundreds of times does this have to be disproven for you to stop using this? Uh, uh, there's this uh, fundamental. Uh, this great quote Tillich says fundamentalism has demonic aspects in that it splits the conscience of its thoughtful adherents and forces them to repress uh, knowledge of which they are secretly aware so why is the fundamentalist and the apologist on the war path well it's against himself 
uh, the unbeliever that, that uh, he goes on crusade against is, is in his own mind. Uh, it's certainly my uh, experience, and I, I believe it's not unusual. So Tillich, in trying to distinguish the kinds of doubt and what they do and don't have to do with science and faith, that clarifies a lot for me. Uh, you're just ruining your faith by infecting it with a doubt you can never get rid of, and you're just ruining your, your historical study by confusing uh, what belief is. Is it, is, a, is it an ultimate concern, or is it a dubious opinion that you must persuade yourself is not dubious? JT was saying last night how you can't just decide to believe that that uh, somebody rose from the dead. Well, uh, he's a little too optimistic. I think I know what he means. You have no business making such a choice. You, you can't properly do it, but of course there are plenty of people whose, whose uh, religious opinions are based simply upon willpower. I want to return to that briefly in a, in a moment. So what about doubt as part of historical method? I just want to explain how that is so in a, in, in, and how this has nothing to do even with necessarily with, it's, this is not tailored specifically to claims that supernatural events have happened, just how the whole idea of historical method has to do with skepticism. I think of a great, great book, really a transcription of lectures by um, Collingwood, an English historian who thought like a German one. He, uh, his book overlaps to a great deal, F.H. Bradley's um, presuppositions of, of uh, critical history, which I guess he's an Englishman too, but he's, he's explaining and defending the Tübingen school and Bauer and Strauss and, and their work and, and its presuppositions. And uh, Collingwood, again, very much like him, um, goes beyond him a bit, but he's, he goes into the history of history, history writing, the history of historiography. And he says modern history writing is a very different thing than what the so-called historians of the ancient world did. Uh, there's a great book by uh, Bernard Lewis called History Recovered, Forgotten, Invented, in which he shows that virtually all ancient so-called history was legitimization narrative. It was all trying to explain how things got the way they are now with the divinely ordained regime of Julius Caesar or whoever. Uh, and of course, that's obviously the case, uh, obvious to us, uh, with, with the Bible. Well, Collingwood said, Sometimes there were people, like in the Middle Ages, who tried to get beyond that a bit. They, they, were di they didn't have any real ax to grind and did wonder what happened in the Middle Ages, but what did they do? Well, they were scissors and paste editors, as he called them. They, believed, they regarded the documents from the past as authorities. The historian deals with his authorities. In fact, you still see this in footnotes in the Revised Standard Version when it says some authorities have this reading. They mean some of our manuscripts have this. And yeah, they used to call all the historical sources our authorities. So they tell us all that we're ever gonna know and it's our business to try to reconcile them if they appear to contradict one another, to reread them and see you know, how we can work that out because we're really at their mercy. We don't know any better. We can't get into a time machine. All we've got to go on is what the ancients have bequeathed us, and so let's see if we can just preserve that and iron it out. Well, that's, uh, that's uh, pre-critical history writing. Uh, modern critical history it happened uh, when historians realized, no, the documents, the reports of the past are not authorities. They are sources. It is the historian who is the authority. Maybe it doesn't want to be, but you've got to pick and choose. You've got to call them like you see them because those contradictions, uh, I'm talking about plenty, the Bible, the Gallic Wars, whatever, right? Those contradictions uh, within and between sources show you that you can't just read it off the page as if it all happened. And, and you do have to take into account the axe grinding character of it. And you find uh, anachronisms and various other signs that all is not well uh, with these as factual reports. So you, you must become the authority to adjudicate, however tentatively, what you think really did happen behind uh, the, the, uh, the document. Sometimes it's helpful information, but sometimes the evidence is not evidence for what it pretends 
to be evidence for, sorry for the sentence, but uh, there is, he says, a history of propaganda. Uh, you, you, for instance, I, in my uh, New Testament dissertation, The Widow Traditions in Luke Acts, uh, I tried to show how all the material in those two New Testament books about women uh, do not just describe the state of women in the early church, but are trying to put down the role of women and restrict it. And so you're not reading uh, the way it really was, but the way someone thought it should have been, not description but prescription. You have to learn how to interpret the evidence and it is not simply a matter of believing it or accepting it. That's oversimplistic and again this does not necessarily get into claims of the supernatural. It might but it follows it, it, it follows through with all history writing. You and how does the historian proceed? Well, it's the old hermeneutical circle that Heidegger and others talked about. You begin with a, hype, a hypothesis, a hypothetical understanding in broad terms uh, of uh, what your study has led you to believe the past was like, admittedly, open to correction, and that's what you hope you're going to do. You look at the various documents and evidence in light of that and begin to uh, revise your initial hypothesis. But, and it's admittedly circular, but in a corrective way, back to the drawing board, that kind of a way. And yet the further you refine it, the more sharp the lens is through which you now view the evidence. And you begin to develop criteria to say, yeah, it says this in plenty, uh, but it couldn't have happened because of this and that. Uh, so um, that tells us uh, two more things that Ernst Trelsch, German theologian and historian, uh, expounded very effectively. Uh, okay, there's the historian is the authority, the documents of the sources. What sort of judgments and how are they made? Well, this idea that you approach it with an initial understanding of the past, always hoping to correct it. What, how, how else could you describe that understanding of the past? Well, Trelch said it would be good to speak of it as he wasn't directly referring to Collingwood. I'm just saying the the ideas sort of bounce off each other this way, um, because they're you know they weren't in that that uh, that order or in contact uh, that way. Uh, you you uh, would use the principle of analogy among others. You would say now if I do not bring to historical reports the presumption that things have always happened more or less the way we see them happen now. No judgment of probability is possible. If, uh, if somebody says, well, in this uh, story uh, says that uh, so-and-so changed into a werewolf on April 15th, 1545, I guess it's true. Uh, no, uh, you don't want to have to be at, at the mercy of any old thing, any medieval chronicler, for example, says, oh, you know, it uh, rained blood out of the sky today, or it literally rained cats and dogs, as some people, or, or, a, uh, or a ship flew through the air and dropped anchor and somebody uh, climbed down the, the anchor rope and then they left uh, after getting a pizza or whatever. Well. Uh, <laughs> Do you have to believe these things because your authorities, the document said so? No. Uh, you doubt it. It looks odd because you know things like this do not happen. Or if they do, the, somebody's been keeping them secret pretty well. Right? That, that uh, this just is not the kind of thing. Now, I know uh, somebody will pop up and say, oh, you're a uniformitarian. Uh, you believe dogmatically that things must have always happened. Well, do you think it used to rain cats and dogs? Is there really any, any chance of that? Why doesn't it anymore? Why did it change? Maybe it did. But the thing is, we're just up the creek at the mercy of any crazy assertion uh, if you don't have some criterion of probability and the only one you've got is present day experience. Now, th that gives you only the right to rule on what probably happened or didn't happen, and that's Trelch's other big principle I want to mention, that the inevitable tentativeness, the provisionality of all historical reconstructions, 
It is not a historian who tells you that the resurrection of Jesus is the best attested fact in history, as several people say. And therefore, we can uh, accept uh, Gary Habermas, another friend of mine, I hate to quote him like this, but he says, if an assertion is accepted by a whole lot of people for a long time, we can consider it a fact. Uh, no, we can't. Uh, afraid we can't do that. Uh, and um, and so we decide what the facts are. We're not simply at the mercy of facts because you have to decide which ones are facts and what do you mean by facts and so forth. And uh, the best you can do is to be to make a tentative judgment. You you can't just have a majority vote on what people think and see what a historical pedigree an idea has, how long people believed it, because I guess more people probably believe the earth is flat than now believe that it isn't, but it isn't flat. Sorry about that. So, but the historian generally, you know, more so than the, I guess that kind of scientist, has to say, here's the way it looks at present, but yeah, it's open to, uh, to change. And of course, that's the scientific approach too, right? The whole paradigm succession thing that Kuhn talks about. You want to come up with the best tentative model, you can. And if somebody else shoots it down, great. Uh, all we want is to get closer to the truth, which we're never quite going to get to, probably, because it's a kind of a north star by which we navigate. You're never going to get on board your boat and get to the north star. No, it's like a guiding light. Uh, you, you're trying to get closer and closer to it. You're trying to get farther and farther out of your ignorance. Uh, but uh, who knows? Who knows? It's conceivable somebody might come up with some alternative uh, paradigm to evolution. But if they, if they did, it would have to explain all the evidence as well or better. It's kind of doubtful anybody will. It would be a heck of a, a boulder to try to, uh, to push uh, to, to accomplish such a thing. So I don't expect it would happen. But nobody would rule it out because all results of honest inquiry are, are, are based on this skepticism and contain the seed of their own demolition. It may never happen, but you're willing to see any view happen. Like the, the, the nuts who deny the Holocaust. Why are they nuts? Because we live so close to it. There's no room for doubt. But suppose uh, my, my father was there at the liberation of Dachau. I heard these gruesome eyewitness accounts for, from him and, and from other people. There's no room for doubt about the Holocaust. Uh, I kind of wish it hadn't happened, but I know it did. Yet it might be that a thousand years in the future, the evidence has vanished. And, and it will become, unfortunately, possible to doubt it. You wouldn't be a nut then, but you are now. And speaking of the history of propaganda, of course, you know, the only people that deny the Holocaust are the ones that are just covering their tracks because they want to make it happen again, uh, Ahmadinejad uh, and so forth. So there's the history of propaganda. But all historical judgments pretend to be no more than provisional. And you can see the problem right here when somebody claims to be like N.T. Wright, who's a used car salesman. He's like Jerry Falwell in a better suit. Uh, N.T. Wright uh, and all these guys posing as historians, making historical judgments. You're just being conned. They don't understand what, what history writing is, just like a creationist does not understand what science is. It's not that they're just doing a bad job of it. It's not that they're just cheating like the guys at Duke at the Rhine Institute, uh, pulling the plug to get the uh, machines to read the right way and give you evidence like Ghostbusters for ESP. No, they just don't know what science is. Uh, and, and that's the problem with, with Christian believers trying to back it up and prove it uh, with, with uh, historical proof. You can't arrive at anything more than a, uh, a, a provisional judgment. Uh, now, I suppose if you actually did have a guy come out of his tomb and a whole bunch of people saw him for a long time and all that, they could be allowed to say, yeah, I can't help but believe this happened. But again, but that's just an if. We don't know that. We don't know that any such thing happened. And we are like those possible people a thousand years from now looking back on the Holocaust, which they can no longer see. 
just up the creek uh, with the resurrection in Jesus, there's just no way ever to know. Uh, again, barring some kind of astounding thing like, uh, anybody see the, the ancient artifact, uh, dubbed German movie, it seemed about five or six hours long, kind of tedious, I got it on Netflix. It was a variation on the lost gospel thing. Archaeologists discover a videotape. <laughs> And, and of course, it was left there by a time traveler, and it kind of was interesting as it, as it developed. But that's what you'd have to have, something like that. And you know, uh, anyway, um, so you you uh, just cannot establish belief by history. That's not what historians do. Uh, my favorite example of the principle of analogy, though, uh, is uh, is this. Uh, suppose you. Uh, come in to your house or apartment from a long day's work, you just plop down in the chair and click on the, the TV with your remote, you don't notice what channel it is, you weren't the last one to use it. The first thing you see in the screen is a giant reptile looming above the Tokyo skyline and stomping the buildings into matchsticks. What's your first reaction? Oh, uh, CNN. <laughs> No, no, uh, you realize, oh, okay, I got the sci-fi channel, or whatever they're calling it now, the thing is, hmm? uh, So it's, it's Godzilla, it's the lost world, it's something like that. Well, you don't know that. I mean, you, you have, uh, there you go with those presuppositions against your, again, your anti-monster dogmatic worldview. Uh, I mean, it's conceivable. I mean, it's, it's I can imagine. Uh, Gojira coming up out of the water and all that. I don't know how it would be, but I can't, I mean, I can't rule it out, but you know, I can't take it too seriously either because I, though I know of no experience uh, by any reliable or unreliable witness, uh, I do know of plenty of cheesy Toho studio flicks in which this happens, and so I have to assume this is another one. I could be wrong. It's a probabilistic judgment, but what are the chances? And that's all you've got. So the one who is skeptical of the resurrection of Jesus or the read see thing, it's, uh, it's not that the historian says, look, I know this never happened because it couldn't have happened. No historian has any business saying that. All you, you can say is there's just no reason to, to say that it's probable. Uh, if we could get back into a time machine, who knows what the results would be. I, I won't lay the odds down, but, it, but since we can't, we have to judge it's improbable. And that's not good enough for, for religious believers and apologists. And they say, well, suppose it did happen, you're just cutting yourself off from, from knowing about it. Well, I guess I am, but that's just the way it is with history. We're not pretending to have some sort of reverse clairvoyance where we can see the past like Rudolf Steiner thought he could. You know, Madame Blavatsky and these people that thought they could just sort of imagine the past and they were seeing it and that's what happened. Atlantis, Lemuria, all that stuff. And so I ask the, 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 the so-called historian, the apologist, what other access do you think you have? I mean, if, if it's inevitably probabilistic, like Karl Barth and other theologians with orthodox beliefs admitted, or Raymond Brown, for instance, the great Roman Catholic, critical New Testament scholar, here's a guy that said, uh, uh, I uh, don't see any real evidence for the virgin birth of Jesus, though I do believe it as a Roman Catholic, but I don't believe it as a historian. I wouldn't try to establish it. It's like he's claiming an alternate epistemology. I would challenge it. I think it's vacuous. I think it's even irresponsible and immoral uh, to uh, say that faith is a virtue, just believing it because somebody says so. Uh, I would r rather take the high ground rather than be made to look like some jerk with, uh, who's unwilling to repent and believe. I'd rather say, no, you've got to do the repenting. Uh, you've got to show me how this, this just believing something with no evidence, except that the Pope said so, is a moral sense. I don't think it is. But, but is, is, it boils down to the will to believe. I was told this happened, I want to believe it, and that's how I know it's true. Uh, but you don't, you don't know it's true. Uh, and now I don't know that it's false, but all I'm claiming is it seems improbable because that's all any historical judgment is. 
So to me, that's how the skepticism is built right into scientific and historical method. It's not a tool used by skeptics or believers uh, to, to gain their ends, as believers would have you think. No, that's just what the method is. And if we don't have it, we're, we're just stuck with sheer credulity. Well, enough of that. Let me hear what you think. Any questions, comments, etc. <laughs> Mm. 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 Go ahead. Uh, your remarks remind me of a review in the New York Review of Books of a recent biography of Joseph Smith uh, by mm. a Uh, that's interesting. I would like to know what he thought about whether Smith thought he had seen an angel or if he just made it up. Uh, to me, that would be the... Uh... Oh, yeah, right, yeah. Uh, and recent biography, was it Larry McMurtry? Yeah. <laughs> that no good Lovecraft hater. <laughs> anyway, uh, um, I got a bone to pick with Ira Levin and a few others on that. But anyway, uh, um, does biography of Joseph Smith doesn't... Uh, venture an opinion on whether Smith was really visited by the angel Moroni. Uh, and uh, how can you write a book without doing that? Uh, and uh, interesting point, I, I, you could say he thought he saw the angel, and that would be relevant because it would simplify things. We could say here is a religious founder who is working from an experience, a shaking, transforming experience, which we might think was, was a hallucination, but, but he didn't and uh, built this world religion pretty recently, remarkable. But if it turns out that he didn't see any angel and just made it up, as I think more likely, especially because, as in the Bible, his stories kept changing. Was it Nephi he saw, or was it Moroni, or you know, who knows, uh, and, uh, or was it a salamander or whatever? Uh, it, it's obvious that the story has grown in the telling. Then things get messy. Now the prophet who founded a world religion appears to be a hoaxer, and we have to ask ourselves if that is enough to discredit the sincerity of the thing, like the, the little gals that created spiritualism by uh, uh, doing this sneaky thing, making people think they were getting Morse code from the beyond when they were, in fact, just uh, tapping the footboard of the bed with their toes, uh, which they later admitted, but still the spiritualists go on. Uh, does, does, does that undermine it? Well, I would kind of think it does. So I have a hunch somebody's just trying not to step on toes there. But I suppose at least you could chronicle the events if that's all he's doing. I haven't read it and don't know. But. And that is a real weird thing. Some of these religious founders like him or Gurdjieff or Madame Blavatsky were certainly fakers and hoaxers, and yet they, that's not all they are. I mean, there'd be easier ways to make money. Uh, and, and they do sort of know their stuff. And they, after all, Smith was lynched. He died as a martyr. He must have somehow believed it on some level, though he was a hoaxer. The, the, uh, the consciousness of the religious founder is very uh, complex and mysterious. Go ahead. Uh, well, the, uh, I guess that would be a causal hypothesis if we could establish that a dead man did come back. Uh, and, and you'd have to ask, well, how could you verify that? I think it still ultimately comes down to the probabilities of the principle of analogy. Because, for instance, as, as Bultmann said, there's no problem suggesting that Jesus was an exorcist and a faith healer. Uh, because people are today. You can go certain places and certain churches and so on and see people doing this. Now, what you think is actually happening is another matter. Is it just abnormal psychology? Is it actual demons? That's not the historian's role. Uh, but to say that, well, Jesus is said to have been an exorcist, well, there certainly were exorcists, whatever they were doing. So that's not odd. But how many people are known to walk on water? 
or change water into wine. No Pentecostal healer ever does that. Uh, Jim Jones pretended to walk on water. I happen to know because I heard this from one of his chief advisors before she was rubbed out in a, an assault on, uh, on her home. Um, Jeannie Mills told me that they had a retreat at the, uh, at the uh, seaside and as the day was breaking, Jim Jones uh, went out into the surf as it was coming in just a few feet and then began to walk back in and somebody said, look, father's walking on the water. And they're waking up bleary eyed and it seems to them he's just finishing up a stroll on the, on the briny blue. Uh, it was faked, uh, so I guess that could happen, but nobody even really claims to, to do that. There are, but there are legends about it. There are various Buddhist and Sufi legends about people walking on the water. And you have to say, well, what does this look most like? Any documented history uh, or uh, other legends? If somebody, if the yogis claim they can change their body temperature, it's kind of weird, but we have cases documented where that seems to be happening. And then, you know, that led to biofeedback and autonomic nerve control. I don't, I'm way out of my depth on that. It's not absurd, but when the TM people claim they can fly through the air, Deepak Chopra says he can walk through walls, show me some evidence. If you could show this is possible simply by virtue of it happening, I'd revise my views. The, these, these these ancient reports that have such things might be true then, but in fact, of course, they're, they're just hoaxers. They, w they won't show you any, uh, any film of this or any live uh, instances which they could do. So uh, you ultimately still have to say, show me a parallel in, uh, in modern uh, experience, I mean, attested experience. You say, well, how about these guys that are on, men and women that are on the operating table and are brought back? Weren't they, in a sense, dead in the only sense we know Jesus was and came back? Well, yeah, but is that all you're claiming the resurrection was? Uh, of course, they, they don't say that. It's supposed to be a real miracle where a rotting dead guy came back to life. Uh, and, uh, or, or suppose you took the example, well, how about zombies? Didn't Wade Davis or whatever his name is from Harvard show that zombies really existed in, the, in Haiti? That, uh, that the, uh, the sorcerers uh, would, would uh, somebody would take out a contract on a rich relative and they would poison him with uh, chemicals that would feign death bury him in a mausoleum, uh, keep an eye on their watch and come back when he was reviving, take him out, kidnap him, drug him and make him a slave laborer in the cane fields. Yeah, we now know that's what happened. There were zombies. That's what, what, what they were. They weren't like in the movies. Well, they were like in the Lugosi movie. Anybody remember? White zombie. For you, my friend, they're the angels of death. Uh, I mean, it, th that's exactly what happened. They weren't the George Romero zombies, though. Now, are you saying that's what Jesus was? That he was drugged? Well, now you're into 18th century rationalism, that the Essenes drugged Jesus on the cross and he wasn't dead. Could have happened. And, and the, the old swoon theory that fundamentalists love to, to ridicule. Oh, you mean to tell me that this uh, guy was beaten within an inch of his life, they barely nursed him back to health, and then he appeared to the disciples as the Lord of life and resurrection? They don't like that because that now they realize that would mean it's not a miracle, but it was proposed by people trying to defend the Bible. This odd group in the 18th century, Protestant rationalists who were committed to the inerrancy of Scripture. Everything it says happened must have happened, but of course there were no miracles. So there must have been naturalistic causation. So Jesus on the cross, yeah, it says so. Jesus alive on Easter, says so, yeah. But how do you get, how do you connect the dots? He must have been drugged. Okay, no miracle, that's all right. They were good Newtonians, they didn't want any miracles. Uh, but uh, that's always the problem you have when you try to prove a miracle happened. You can only make it amenable to the criteria of, of, of measurable science, which means you whittle away the miracle part. Oh, we've proven the star of Bethlehem uh, appeared. It was an alignment of uh, Jupiter, Venus, and uh, Saturn. I'm sorry, pal, but if that's what it was, Matthew is wrong, not right, right? Because he says it was a star that floated through the air and all that, right? That, if you're right, the Bible is wrong. The closer you can make it acceptable in naturalistic scientific terms, the more you have debunked the miracle claim. You prove it, it ain't miraculous. 
Now, it could have happened, but if it did, we will never know. As Karl Barth admitted, he believed Jesus really came out of the tomb. He says, however, if you think you got to prove it or you want to prove it, you're out of luck, my friend. I'm just willing to believe it, he, he, he said. I, I have a strange kind of respect for that. At least he's not trying to muck up historical method. He's indulgent in wishful thinking, but he's not smuggling it into historical method. So miracles really don't turn out to be much of a special case. It's just an, an odd event that defies the principle of analogy. Oh, go ahead. Well, that works to a certain degree if you're not interested in pursuing certain other problems, like uh, the notion, is the notion of God viable even as a philosophical notion? What is it he believes uh, is going on when he's praying? But that is a different issue. They're really, however you come out on that, it, it, what he's doing apparently is to say, Let's assume God has always worked as he works now in very subtle ways, as Bultmann said, uh, within events rather than between them, not a puppeteer who, who yanks the strings and makes things happen somehow, something visible only to the eye of faith, and, and, that, and uh, so there's, there's no miracles, no interruptions of nature. That's a viable view. I don't think you lose anything. You, you could be as orthodox as the day is long, even about the atonement, if you thought there was reason to believe it. And you say, okay, Jesus died on the cross, and because of that, God forgives us. You, that's in a zone where you, you're making assertions that could never really be verified or falsified, and uh, I guess that's why some like to retreat there. And they would say, I, I think as Bultmann did, that believing in supernaturalism becomes a false stumbling block. He says, that's not the real issue with religion or the Bible. The real issue is, are you going to, you, you like to borrow the terms of Heidegger, uh, are you going to live an authentic existence? And the gospel of Christ is about that, abandoning, kind of like an AA approach, very much like that, that you're going to fail if you live off of your own resources. You need to open yourself up to that which is higher. Says, you don't need miracles for that, and if you think you do, you're off, off on the wrong track anyway. So I think that's sort of a viable thing. It just depends depends on what other, issue, what other Pandora's boxes he's willing to open. He might find on totally different grounds, oh geez, there's no real reason to believe in a God or answered prayer, I, I guess that doesn't pass muster, but it sounds like he hasn't really seen a problem with those things yet. That's what uh, Demand calls blindness and insight. Uh, you reach a certain level of realization that solves certain problems, but if you understood more, which you may yet do, you couldn't rest where you are now. It, it only seems to work because of what you don't know as well as what you do. So it depends on how far he follows it out. The truth doesn't work for everybody. That's a sobering uh, uh, realization. Any other? Uh, sure. Oh, go ahead. Hmm. Hmm. 
Yeah, the Jesus Seminar I took the approach of debating every inch of the four Gospels and Thomas, I believe, to uh, scrutinize the sayings which they did for, well, I guess it was the, yeah, it was the sayings for some five and a half years, and then the stories for another five and a half, and they, not everybody agreed, and so the, the general tally was, uh, when it was over, that the, um, that some, I think it was 18% of, of, coincidentally, of the sayings and of the stories, they thought, really did happen or that Jesus really said them. And uh, now how would you know? I think that is way too optimistic, uh, just applying the same criteria. And what are they? Well, one of the biggies is anachronism. Uh, like in the Gospel of Thomas, some the disciples asked Jesus, is there any point in circumcision? And Jesus says, if there were, their mothers would produce them circumcised from the womb. Now, interesting little saying, is there any way if Jesus was a Palestinian Jew that his disciples would ask him if circumcision, the foundation stone of the covenant of Abraham, is worthwhile? No, this couldn't have come up. It sure could have come up and did come up in the Gentile mission, as when you read the epistle of the Romans, where it actually does say, is circumcision of any value? Because he's dealing with Jews and Gentiles. Does circumcision give the Jew any advantage over the uncircumcised Gentile convert? So that's, so, so what must have happened is somebody in the matrix of that debate says, let me pull rank and say that Jesus came to me and said this. Oh, okay, Jesus trumps Paul. And uh, so, because if something like that didn't happen, what are you going to do? Or fasting. Uh, should Christians fast as the Pharisees and the disciples of John the Baptist did? Well, you got about four different answers ascribed to Jesus. Was he a multiple personality? Uh, did he keep changing his mind? Or, or isn't it rather that there was no known teaching of Jesus and people just kept fabricating quotes to win the debate? Uh, and there are a lot of things like that. Uh, it, uh, the book of Acts tells us that it was hard to get it started preaching the gospel to Gentiles because they had the traditional view, you know, we don't want to associate with these guys. They eat unkosher food and so on. Very difficult to decide this. The Messiah didn't really even come for them. Uh, you know, they may be saved in turn, but this isn't for Gentiles. Real tough fight. But ev eventually they said, all right, yeah, Christ is for everybody. Well, suddenly you read, like the Great Commission in Matthew, the parting words of the resurrected Son of God, go into all the nations, discipling them, baptizing them in my name, etc. Wait a second, did Jesus say that and everybody just kind of forgot it? You know, if he had said this, th th keep in mind, the, the last words on earth of the Son of God, that's not going to shape their conduct? Well, obviously, somebody fabricated that to, to, to weigh in, to put the thumb on the scale in the debate. Hey, I, I got a prophecy, a, a quote of Jesus here. Yeah, we got to do it. Well, okay, I can't beat that. Uh, and, and so you notice contradictions, anachronisms, and, and of, of which there are many. And you realize, yeah, gee, or give up everything you own and follow me. That really fits in a martyrdom s sort of a situation when Christianity is a persecuted sect. That couldn't happen within the time of the founder. So, or my favorite, uh, if anyone would follow me, let him take up his cross and come after me. Surely that means you know Jesus died on the cross. But he's depicted as saying this to a bunch of people that, that have come to hear him speak. They couldn't possibly have known what he was talking about. So he didn't say it. It's, it's a Christian uh, saying from a sermon or something later. And so much of it falls prey to the these criteria, and there are other ones too, that they figured the precious little of the stuff actually goes back to them. That doesn't mean what doesn't is bad or nefarious. It just came from other creators. And, uh, and I think you can use the same criteria on almost all the material. I try to show that in The Incredible Shrinking Son of Man. There is really no surviving evidence for, for a Jesus.